Hello, everyone, and welcome back to your favorite wrestling podcast right here on the Video Bros Network. It is Ring Respect Radio. I am Bobby Munson, and I'm joined, as always, by my video bro. He is the man with the angelic voice, the throat of the goat, Mr. Papa Smokes. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good, Munson, and how are all my wrestling people out there? Hopefully everyone's doing good, staying safe, staying healthy, and hey, Papa Smokes, I know that uh, we've had some great things going on here on Ring Respect, and... Uh, couple of meetings that we've had as of late, some big stuff coming up here in 2021, nothing that we're going to reveal here on the show today, but make sure to stay tuned to what Pop and Smokes and I are uh, laying down each and every week because eventually we have got some major news to bring to all of you coming up very soon, and we hope it will be positive in your lives. But hey, speaking of positivity, keep the positivity flowing and go ahead and click the subscribe button. There's my finger right down below, right down there. Click it now. Then hit that ring little bell right beside it. Go ahead and hit that. That's the notification bell. You'll know any time that Papa Smokes and I lay down new material right here on the Video Bros Network. Anyways, we're doing some reviews again, Papa Smokes. Uh, we're down with some MLW. We uh, got at Never Say Never to take care of. Also, episode 128 that we're going to be talking about on the show today. Hey, we're recording this on April the 20th, though. So happy 420 to you, Papa Smokes. Yeah, happy 420. All right. Yeah, anyways, I was having this uh, talk with somebody at work recently, and I uh, said that Bobby Monson and Papa Smokes are the answer to what would happen if Cheech and Chong became independent wrestling commentators. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> anyways, enough of that. We'll get past the 420. You yeah, know, roll them if you got them, light them up, smoke them, and enjoy this episode. And in the meantime, hey, we're talking about Never Say Never, Papa Smokes. This was the uh, big card that we've been talking about for weeks on our show here leading up to this big event for MLW. Never say never, big card, and opened up with a uh, match between one of the members of Injustice. Like, this was the whole Injustice versus Contra night when you break it down. Started off with Simon Gotch and Jordan Oliver. Uh, there was a bit of a video package that they played before. And, hey, something that they brought up in that video package that you've mentioned many times before is about the attack that Contra unit did on Injustice former member Cotto Brazil. I like that they touched on that there as well, too, talking about how they took him out. Now almost kind of hinting at the fact that Tankman now on the side of Injustice a little bit heading into tonight. But we're going to get rolling with that first match. Simon Gotch, Jordan Oliver, what did you think? I, I thought this was pretty good. I, th I thought it was uh, a match that went back and forth a little bit. It, it showcased some of the talents of each. For Gotch, it's the uh, mat wrestling. For Jordan Oliver, it's more of an aerial attack. And uh, this was pretty okay match. What did you think of this one? Yeah, I liked it. It was a good way to start off the night. Um, you know, we've talked in depth about these guys many times on the show. I uh, love Simon Gotch's mat wrestling. I love the fact that he could bring it down to that level, especially off the start. It was quick to start, but there was that back and forth kind of mat grappling between the two of them. And I think Oliver seems to be picking up working with good guys like this. Good guys like this are bringing him down to that level of doing some mat grappling, getting a little bit more creative on that side. Instead of worrying about going straight immediately to the high flying and the big, you know, jump starts all the time, they really ground this a little bit, get you, you know, building it up, building it up, and then bring out the heavy hitting, higher flying stuff that Oliver will, you know, spring towards in the middle towards the end of the matches. Nice stuff from both guys. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, and a big win for Jordan Oliver. I, I maybe didn't see coming. I thought maybe Contra was going to take this one. Simon Gotch pick up a win. No, maybe we're going to see a whole different thing here tonight. Jordan Oliver, big win. Yeah, yeah. And this was a nice, uh, nicely laid out match, I thought. Uh, just over nine minutes long. Didn't need uh, any longer than that, I didn't think. Gotch, uh, like we mentioned, was a jujitsu expert, uh, had had Oliver down on the mat for a long time, was working body parts. It, this looked pretty convincing. Got, Gotch is the real deal for sure. And he's got the last name to prove it too. But uh, he looked uh, like he was a very experienced uh, martial artist. He looked like he was uh, sadistic in his attack. You could tell he was enjoying the pain he was inflicting on Oliver. Oliver showing it on his face like a good wrestler, showing us the pain he's in. This was completely uh, believable. Uh, uh, both guys selling to the camera very well, I thought, but uh, uh, Oliver on a bit of a hot streak, a bit of a rise right now. He, we have seen him lose to Simon Gotch uh, in weeks past, 
But uh, this one, he came off the second rope, hit that cutter for the finish, and uh, the he got the pinfall one, two, three, and this one's in the books. Yeah, there seems to be a real big push for Jordan Oliver going on at the moment. Uh, a lot more exposure on television for him, which seems to be getting him a lot more work even outside of Major League Wrestling. I'm starting to see a lot more cards that he's popping up on on the independent circuit. Seems to be picking up a real big name for himself. So this big push could be great things for MLW. I believe the commentators even mentioned he's only 20, 21 years old, something like that. So, I mean, this kid's yeah. got a long, long career ahead of him. Looking good here. Again, Brought into this match with a great worker, Simon Gotch. We can't say enough to praise for him. And great that Simon Gotch now puts Jordan Oliver over. Or Oliver looks good coming out of this thing. And uh, both guys one up to each other. I mean, there could be a uh, so-called rubber match down the line for these two guys. Yeah, and if this, continu- if this feud continues on like it has been of Injustice versus Contra, We'll almost certainly see that, and uh, possibly in singles matches, possibly in tag matches. Uh, yeah, I have the feeling we haven't seen the last of this feud. No, oh, not at all, and that's okay with me because it's been great so far. Uh, from there, we had big announcement on Never Say Never, Papa Smokes. We could probably talk about this one for a bit. It seems like MLW have officially signed a deal with Dragon's Gate in Japan. This is something that Court Bauer and MLW had been working on uh, pre-COVID pandemic times. Uh, but the everything kind of fell to the wayside by the sounds of it. Not completely off the table, but just things didn't progress once COVID hit and uh, the pandemic shut things down for a while. But now the ball is in motion. There's big things coming, big events planned, Dragon Gate Japan. MLW, another international blend being brought into the MLW uh, talent roster. Man, I'm excited for this. I don't know about you. I heard this announcement and I was like, fuck yeah, this is great news. Yeah, I think so too. It's We've talked about the international uh, dealings of Court Bauer and MLW. They have the ongoing deal with AAA Lucha in Mexico City. And now a deal with Dragon Gate in Japan. This is really good news for the MLW fans, us included, because we're just going to get a, an influx of new talent. Uh, and also, I like to see talent uh, from different countries. I like to see what they're up to. As we know, the the Mexicans very into lucha. It's a different style. It's 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 interesting to watch uh, your favorite wrestlers on uh, MLW interact with the luchadors. Now we're going to get Japanese style, which, as as every wrestling fans know, uh, tends to lead the way in professional wrestling uh, in in uh, new styles of booking, new styles of in ring work, and, and new maneuvers as well. And uh, I, I'm just very excited for this partnership. Uh, I tip my hat to Court Bauer again. He's got the uh, he's got his feelers all all. Uh, in various areas throughout the world in order to keep bringing us fresh talent. And uh, I couldn't be happier as a fan. Yeah. And I mean, this coincides with another piece of big news that did drop, I believe yesterday from MLW as we're recording this on the 20th of April. And the big news being that it appears that MLW have struck a deal with Vice TV as well. So all this expansion that Court Bauer has been doing with all these different companies, Dragon's Gate, AAA, like you say, and all the different companies are starting to amalgamate under the MLW umbrella. And now he's reached out to Vice TV, which have been doing phenomenal work in the wrestling community as well, too. I'm very much looking forward to this. And, you know, awesome, great news for MLW on both the Vice TV signing and the Dragon's Gate deal as well, too. Yeah, I got to congratulate uh, MLW and, and Court Bauer on that one. Uh, it seems like uh, from what I've seen of Vice TV, they have an interest in professional wrestling. They've done not only the Dark Side of the Ring series, but a few other uh, documentary style series about backyard wrestling and some other uh, points of interest. But I always had the feeling that they wanted a wrestling program on their network and uh, perhaps they've been... Uh, negotiating with various companies or I don't know the ins and outs of the business but I'm very very glad to hear that it's major league wrestling that'll be on vice tv yeah it's fantastic news I love to see that they're continuing to grow uh court bauer reaching all new heights I mean many people worried about you know their their like for either one of the big companies or the other and meanwhile they're all missing out on this great fantastic wrestling that's going on in major league wrestling as well as these great things that court bauer is doing i think this guy is gonna shock the world and come up and show 
just how awesome MLW is. I believe there's going to be a much bigger audience for MLW and it will grow as we continue to see this great booking and this great, and these great deals coming in. And again, with the international flavor, just the icing on the cake, again, being able to be exposed to wrestling without having to search through YouTube and all these different things to find matches of particular guys that are being talked about. We get to see this exposure. Like again, we can mention a guy like Zenshi. I don't know if we would have necessarily had a chance to see Zenshi's work if it weren't for MLW. And I think that we would have been robbed of some great wrestling in ring if we wouldn't have been able to see Zenshi. So, you know, props to MLW for everything they're doing and for the great wrestling we're going to continue to see. So from there, we'll continue back to Never Say Never. We could go on about all the great things of MLW and they're moving forward on to great things as well too. But hey, we got to talk about more matchups. And we had another matchup between Contra and Injustice. This time it was Davari taking on Myron Reed. Uh, again, this one, we know Davari looks fantastic. Myron Reed just been on a bit of a roll. He just, you know, I mean, he lost recently to Leo Rush, his uh, middleweight championship. But at the same time from there, he's continued to pick up steam, getting one ups on Contra unit as well too. But damn, Davari looking sharp going into this one. What do you think, Pop Smokes, and how this one played out? Yeah, this is another uh, matchup we've seen uh, in past weeks too. And, and Davari won that last match, beat down Myron Reed after it. So you know that Reed had some uh, some incentive coming into this one. Um, and also, uh, you know that it's getting personal in this match too because uh, Myron Reed postponed his title rematch with Leo Rush in order to take this match. And as we know, uh, uh, if you uh, defer your title rematch in, in any uh, uh, federation and then lose your next match, you might not be in that title picture anymore. So you have to be pretty serious when you do that. And uh, Byron Reed, uh, as we've seen as a member of Injustice, is uh, uh, very committed to uh, ending the, the reign of Contra over MLW. Yeah, it's been a great feud that's been put back and forth. I mean, great. Again, Myron Reed, another one that's young, getting great exposure in that ring, getting work with great talents. davari has been around for quite a long time. They were able to work nicely inside that matchup together. It was exciting. It, you know, was, you know, something that I could sit there and enjoy. Uh, I did think there was a couple spots. I got to say, I didn't like about this uh, as much as I did enjoy the match for the most part, there was a couple spots I did write down. I believe that the figure four was applied incorrectly in this match. I don't know if you caught this, Pop Smokes, but I'm pretty sure I saw it incorrectly applied in this one. Well, yeah, I remember it being applied, but I, I didn't actually watch the uh, application of it. Was he doing it uh, Hulk Hogan style, like from the wrong side? Yeah, it kind of looked like it was done completely where it wouldn't yeah. be putting any pressure the way a figure four should. I mean, they still sold it because you that's your job inside there, but I think that it was applied incorrectly. I mean, I could be wrong. That's just what I saw. And then the chest protector thing drove me fucking insane. It's why it's even there at this point is kind of silly to begin with. It's unnecessary. It doesn't really flow anymore. And then the amount of time that Reed spent trying to get that damn thing back on when he could have just pinned his opponent or gone for that finisher right there. It prolonged it too much at that point. I did not care for that. I wish they would have just cut that, just said, fuck it, no chest protector, just finish the match, make it look solid. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in uh, times past, before COVID, we had seen Myron Reed uh, working more as a heel, and he was using that chest protector. I mean, there was a, he had an injury angle kind of like uh, Cowboy Bob Orton's cast. He said he had an injury and he had to wear it, but he was using it against his opponents as a foreign object type thing. So the, the, the chest protector had some heat in times past. However, at, at this juncture, when we've got Injustice versus Contra, Injustice seems to be more in the kind of babyface role of this. So he, him using his chest protector as a foreign object or to get the advantage doesn't seem to be happening anymore so in that their previous encounter that they had Davari versus Myron Reed Davari had stolen the chest protector and put it on himself they were making like a little bit of an angle out of that knowing that Reed would be pissed off to have his his item of clothing stolen or whatever 
I get what they were trying to do here, but I also get your uh, frustration with it. And did you notice when Byron Reed hit that 450 splash to finish the match, the damn thing was all over his face and you couldn't see and everything. And uh, it turned out to be, a, he, he hit the, the, the move all right, but uh, turned out to be a little bit of a pain in the ass, I suppose. And uh, yeah, maybe it's time to be done with the chest protector. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't mind if he wears it, it's fine. But again, don't use the spot if you can't pull it off quick enough. I know at a point, obviously, Myron Reed realized he was struggling and kind of shrugged his shoulders as if to, as if to say, oh, well, fuck it. But so much time yeah. elapsed at that point that you would believe that Davari would, especially a guy the caliber of Davari, would not still be waiting there to get the the splash at that point in time. I feel like the uh, it was prolonged a little too long in this case. Uh Real no fault to the two guys involved. I mean, they did great otherwise. I'm being a little bit nitpicky because sometimes we got to say the, the things we dislike about a match as well, just as much as the things we love. Sure, sure. Overall, though, I thought this was a pretty fine match. I, I liked the psychology of it. Uh, as per MLW, they, they wrestled for the first four or five minutes without any rule breaking going on. Uh, they, they looked like a real contest. And then... Uh, uh, as much as I like Byron Reed, I really think Davari looks good in there. Uh, not only his amazingly built body, but uh, uh, just the moves he was doing, the way he uh, uh, separated a body part and worked on that. He worked on the knee for a while, on the back for a while. This is good psychology in pro wrestling. And uh, yeah, aside from a couple of uh, things, I thought this was a pretty good match. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Bob Smoes. It was a really good match. Uh, again, love the fact that most MLW matches have a good majority of wrestling inside that ring. And that's what keeps us coming back every week and wanting to review these things again. I mean, we can find our little nitpicky faults, but again, they're more constructive criticisms or us just venting about a little nonsensical thing that really doesn't matter. Cause in the grand scheme of things, we do enjoy this. And I got to ask you this though. So Myron Reed picks up the win here. Injustice or 2-0 and over a Contra on the night, did you not start to think just for a minute there's a chance that Tankman's walking out the new champion? Or at least in some way, he's winning the match without taking the title with him. Yeah, yeah, I nibbled on that a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, Tankman was too new uh, a star or, and too new of a wrestler, I think, to go over in this title match. But the way they built it was pretty good, and the way they laid out the match was pretty good, too. We'll get to this, I guess. But, uh, uh, yeah, there was question in my mind about how this main event was going to go. And they, uh, in the build-up to this, Tankman had hit his flying tackle and sent uh, Fatu flying across the ring. I mean, they, they did a good job of making it look like, hey, this guy's big, and it's possible that he could beat the big monster champion. Yeah. And I mean, it, you start to have your doubts. I mean, I didn't think that we'd be seeing, I thought, you know, the typical booking in wrestling these days would have been to have Contra win one of the matches and Justice win one and have everyone go, oh, who's going to win the third of the night. But in this case, we had two up for injustice. I, I started to think, if nothing else, Fatu's getting disqualified or counted out, something along those lines. Tankman keeps his undefeated streak, all this. We'll get into that in a minute because just before we got to our main event, we also had Alicia doing an interview with Gino Medina and Richard Holiday. So a Zoom-based interview between the three of them. And uh, this was interesting uh, to lay out the fact that they are going to have a Caribbean Championship match at the next show, which would be in two weeks from Never Say Never, as they had an off week after the uh, event Never Say Never. Uh, Caribbean championship between the match. I'm excited about this prospect. Should be interesting to see. Uh, what do you think of the interview in general, though, Pop Smokes? Well, not too bad. Uh, I like the uh, segments with Alicia because you get to see uh, the interview uh, as uh, as opposed to the promo where, uh, you know, the, they have to answer some questions and it's not just what the wrestler wants to say. It's what they get asked kind of thing. So, uh these are pretty good. Uh, again, the simmering tension between Holiday and a two, but uh, mostly uh, just some jaw jacking between Holiday and Medina. And uh, good to see uh, the way they, they already have this uh, problem between each other from when uh, Gino Medina left uh, the faction dynasty. And uh, 
you know, we, depending on who you listen to, was he fired or did he quit? But this, this uh, sets up this genuine dislike these two have for each other. You can believe that they'd go hard in a match against each other. And uh, you knew that, that each one wanted to pin the other one real bad, even just for bragging rights. Oh, did they ever? And you know what I really like, too, is Richard Holiday, just a natural talker, and he's becoming better each and every time I see him. He gets in yeah. there. You don't feel like anything's scripted, which I, I believe in MLW. That's not the case. These are not scripted promos or anything like that. They might have a guideline or something. I'm not sure. But it feels real. And Richard Holiday not only makes it feel real, he stays in the mode the whole time. He knows how to react to everything the other person's saying in this case, whether it's Alicia or Gino coming at him. He controlled the entire show during that interview, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. His his verbal skills are awesome. His wrestling's quite good also. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if I liked Richard Holiday when I first started watching ML, MLW, but that's changed a lot over the past months, especially since the restart uh, earlier this year. I think he's looked awesome, and uh, he's getting a little bit of a push as well, and uh, it's working for me. I, I can't wait to see more. He's got some size. He's got that natural charisma that's coming along more and more for him. And again, uh, you know, we, we talk about his link up with MJF being uh, dynasty before MJF leaving for AEW and stuff like that. I think considering what's gone on since that departure, I got to say, I'm leaning towards being more Richard holiday fan. I loved what MJF did. I loved what he was doing, but considering what he's doing now and, uh, Fuck MJF, really. I mean, Richard Holiday's the man in that situation. Yeah, I feel like MJF's talents are being wasted to a certain extent right now, but we won't get into that right now. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, Holiday's uh, uh, keeping uh, keeping it going in MLW and uh, per perhaps uh, influenced a bit by MJF. We don't know. Maybe it's vice versa, but. Uh, uh, a smarmy heel, uh, a rich boy, a good talker, looks great, and uh, wrestling pretty good. Uh, yeah, I'm into it. Yeah, me too, man. It was good. So from there, we got our main event. Let's talk about it. This is Rick, uh, Calvin Tankman, Jacob Fatu, the MLW Heavyweight Championship. Again, we were talking before about the buildup to this one. Again, seeing that scene again where Fatu gets laid out by Tankman with that shoulder thrust check that almost football tackle like check and the way Fatu just does that spin flip across the ring gets a lot of air time on it as well too just made it look beautiful so this I was looking forward to a couple of big big boys going at it a couple of guys that on equal size can really work uh, we know Tankman has a lot of ability to move that heavyweight hustle inside that ring Jacob Fatu is just fucking phenomenal at the same time um if there was a couple of nitpicky things i thought you know i was glad tankman saved a couple of the moves that he tried to pull in this matchup for a big event feel kind of thing so there was the one off the ropes with the arm drag i hadn't seen him do before a couple of those moves i'm glad he saved for this and at the same time didn't quite execute them to perfection either so were they necessary not particularly but i do see what he was going for he wanted to show us something different from what we had seen in some of his squash matches know that there's more in the arsenal and show that he is worthy i guess of being in this championship matchup uh prove it he did i gotta say great work from calvin tankman throughout the entirety of the matchup but again being in there with jacob fought too i'm pretty sure at this point you could throw just about anyone in there with jacob fought too and you're going to turn off out at least a reasonably decent matchup because he is phenomenal. Probably one of the best in the industry at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they kind of uh, suggested something before the match was uh, there, there was the rumors floating around that Calvin Tankman had had food poisoning earlier in the week. Yeah. That started me to thinking like, yeah, why do you got to say that you guys now you're kind of uh, showing us maybe a hint of what's to come in the outcome of this match. But uh, uh, I don't know, an attempt to make him not look any weaker. Uh, uh, I thought it was good. Uh, the first couple matches or sorry, the first couple minutes of this match were pretty good. Tankman uh, came out with some uh, energy and some strength and was uh, dominating the first couple minutes of this match through agility and uh, strength. 
they uh, they were getting him over uh, versus Fatu. Fatu eventually ended up taking over this match with uh, heel moves, rule breaking, heavy strikes, uh, choking with the wrist tape. I always like that one. Oh, he uh, pushes the referee's patience as long as they can, but you can tell the referees are scared of him as well, right? So like. He gets away with a lot of uh, shenanigans behind the referee's back. Uh, Tankman looked resilient through most of this, but uh, you could tell he was gassing a little bit. This wasn't a very long match either. This was just over 10 minutes, but you could see that by seven or eight minutes, uh, Tankman was getting gassed. He's a heavy guy. We get that. Uh, he does a lot of amazing shit in the ring, but uh, you know you can't ex- you can't expect the big guy to do it without uh, breathing heavily a little bit. And uh, yeah, the, it it also fit in the match well too because uh, Fatu took over once Tankman looked uh, tired and all that. Um, eventually, hitting the flag shot as Davari put the flag in the ring and. Uh, with the referee distracted, uh, Fatu hits the flag shot to the head, then the springboard moonsault and uh, pinfall one, two, three. Nice finish, nice ending, nothing fancy, but um, got both guys over quite nicely. Tankman looking like he's for real as a challenger. Fatu looking strong and dominant as the champ, as always. Uh, found it interesting, too, they announced that this was uh, Fatu's ninth title defense, too, so for all the time he's had that belt, uh, not a whole ton of defenses, but all successful, real good stuff. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of those title defenses have come within recent months too, since the restart. I mean, yep. we had him. He had a defense against Davy Boy Smith Jr. He's had one against Jordan Oliver, and I believe ACH as well too. So I mean, that's four of the nine right there, if I'm thinking off the top of my head correctly. So I mean, that's yeah. uh, crazy the amount that uh, gone on. Four fought too, but he's a great worker. Again, I like the fact that you uh, brought up about uh, Tankman uh, getting gassed uh, there in the match. I mean, yeah, big guys will definitely get uh, definitely get gassed after working that kind of matchup and everything. Um, something of interest that gets brought up and talked about fought two took over when Tankman was gassed. I was listening to uh, Bret Hart speak recently about his time working with the uh, late great Yokozuna and say that. One thing he did when he was working with him is he allowed Yokozuna to kind of say more centered in the ring while Brett did the running and the more of the movement and stuff like that, allowing him to keep that energy toward until towards the end of the match where he could then come out and be explosive at the end and give that excitement towards the end of the match instead of having him burn it up in the first four or five minutes like a lot of the other guys on the roster like to do to him kind of thing. And you bring it up, and it was kind of that way where, uh, again, Tankman got gassed and then Fatu took over. But in so many ways, it also worked with Fatu being the heel, him being the one that's more explosive at the end and using those dirty tactics to try to get that victory. Uh, yeah, both guys getting over very well. Again, Fatu looks every bit the impossible to defeat champion that he has looked for a long time now. While at the same time, Tankman looking like a viable contender especially if he continues to work on it and builds himself up over this next year there is possibility that tankman could be looking at more title opportunities down the line yeah i think without question and uh this match uh served its purpose nicely too uh, uh fatu looking very tough very dominant as the champ but calvin tankman as we know he's a he's a rookie with mlw i I looked into some of his past. I don't think he's been wrestling all that long. So, I mean, it's understandable that a, a young kid like that getting his first big title opportunity, he's not going to win it against a wily champion. So uh, uh, Tankman doesn't look any weaker for taking the pinfall in this. Fatu still looks dominant and uh, crushing as a champion. So uh, this match uh, accomplished exactly what it set out to do and uh, put both uh, wrestlers over. Sure did. And that's uh, what Never Say Never did. Did it accomplish putting everybody on this card over in a great way? Great matchups. I got to give a big thumbs up to MLW on Never Say Never this year. Uh, you as well, Papa Smokes, just want to get your approval. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I would have liked another match or two, but uh, yeah. I also kind of think it's charming just to have the three 
main uh, feud matches that you have going on right now, uh, especially just Contra versus uh, Injustice. It, it was nice like that. I liked it. It didn't take a whole lot of time. He, each match was was 10 minutes or less, and uh, just as more testament in the uh, wrestling business today that you don't have to have 20-minute competitive matches all the time. An 8- or 10-minuter on TV will do very nicely. You can get lots of spots in in a 10-minute match as we just watched, and uh, I don't think there's any point in doing it longer. It's just uh, wrestlers these days want to get all their shit in, and it takes a longer time, but yeah, as far as uh, match psychology, I, I find just the eight to ten minute match is pretty much perfect for most uh, most matches. Yeah, I'd like to see half these people who think they need to watch twenty minute matches go and get inside of a competitive sport for twenty minutes long and see if it's absolutely necessary and if they would be moving around the same way that they're expecting these performers to perform after twenty minutes. It gases you out entirely being in that kind of competition stuff like that uh speaking from experience not from uh professional wrestling ring but from uh mat wrestling experience and boxing and stuff like that again you're taught endurance in short periods of time and stuff like that because most of that happens in short spurts of time it's it's all especially in uh mat to mat wrestling you're given two halves of five minutes each you're no longer than a 10 minute match total and it feels like an eternity when you're in there you start to get gassed you start to really become kind of slower towards the end and it becomes boring in some ways. So, I mean, again, these guys who think it needs to go on 20, 30 minutes, it just gets to be too much. There are spots that are okay to go longer matchups with certain feuds, certain cards, certain pay-per-views, it fits, but not every match on television. You're right. 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes is absolutely perfect as proven here. Huge props to MLW for never say never. Yes. Two thumbs up from Papa Smokes. Sweet. Uh, so we're going to go on to episode 128. Before we do, I didn't say it at the top of the hour. So a big shout out to the boys over at Backbreaker Media who've been doing great work helping us out. Also going to give a shout out to the Canadian Wrestling Network who Backbreaker Media has formed an alliance with, which means that you can find Ring Respect Radio episodes on the Canadian Wrestling Network's uh, website now, also through their social media and all of Backbreaker Media stuff as well too. So every time I check online, it seems like we're in more places than we were the last time I checked Pop Smokes. It's growing rapidly. Um, it's hard to keep up with. It's been fantastic being able to reach out to everybody like this and continue to do what we do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, many shout outs always to Backbreaker Media for helping us get out there. And uh, our friends from Alberta, we, we uh, enjoy interacting with them and we enjoy uh, sharing uh, all kinds of wrestling content with them. And thanks again to those guys. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, so from there, let's uh, start on episode 128 of MLW here on the show. Uh, this one ended up having a lot of uh, content, a lot of matchups on it. I made a note and I talked to you before we went live on the air about how I called this the heel versus heel because a couple of matchups really were worked heel versus heel matchups, which we will talk about. Um, we started the night off very interestingly. I'm not sure where this was planning to go. Uh, Selena came out to cut a promo uh, at the top of the hour. And then she was cut off by the, I guess, the personal assistant to El Jefe or the Azteca Underground's personal assistant that's been uh, in around the matchups that have been going on and everything. He came and actually held his hand over top of the camera, told him to shut the camera off, and then started scolding Selena, saying that she did not have the permission at El Jefe to be doing what she's doing tonight. Yeah, yeah, and isn't that interesting after... Uh... We've seen her run her manipulations over the last two years in MLW, and she's she's put a lot of uh, put a lot of stuff over on a lot of people, and uh, and stayed in the in the driver's seat kind of. But now we're seeing the, the tide turning for her. Her uh, all of her manipulations are starting to turn around on her, and this is uh, very amusing to me, uh, and and I'm sure to a lot of the fans too. She's gotten in over her head. And uh, there are people that are not pleased with her. It sounds like she owes some people some money in, uh, in Mexico there too. And that could be a very uncomfortable situation. I'll be interested to see how she tries to wiggle out of that one. 
Yeah, and I mean, I, I love how badass El Jefe seems without even knowing who the hell El Jefe is. I mean, it's the way they built this whole thing is exciting because he's he's a mystery, an enigma. We know he's powerful. We got big guys that are willing to work for him and do his dirty work for him. I mean, guys the size of Mil Mortez and L.A. Park and, uh, you know, his sons and stuff like that are willing to do the bidding of El Jefe. Selena seems legitimately worried for once in her life as well too about el jefe who is this guy we don't know but i even i'm starting to get a little bit worried about who el jefe is he's starting to put a little fear into old bobby here pop smokes yeah yeah with those deep pockets he can get a lot of stuff done whatever he wants to get done and uh selena knows that she's she has a healthy fear of him i think as do uh, any of the other guys from azteca underground that knows who he is yeah, you fear the man with the money and the power because he can make stuff happen. And and uh, I, I have the feeling in the next upcoming couple of weeks, we'll get a, at least a hint or maybe an unveiling of who El Jefe actually is. We've both had our predictions about that, but uh, I think we'll get it announced pretty soon. And uh, I think he's going to come in and say his piece. Jeez, with some of the uh, video packages that were dropped on this particular episode, I started to think that you might be right because there was a lot of Conan references coming yeah. up in the video packages. So I'm like, son of a bitch, Pop Smoke's going to get me on this one. He's going to be right about this. Yeah. Uh, Conan owes her one from before, for sure. She she got the better of him one time, and I, I've been kind of waiting for him to come back and make a fool of her. Uh, I, I think you still think it might be him that does it. Yeah, it's going to be interesting either way. I mean... This is an exciting time. I'm I'm loving the build of this thing. I'm glad they haven't just gone and revealed who El Jefe is immediately. I like that maybe this will actually carry on until their debut on Vice TV. This could be a really big way to debut on Vice TV is to have the, you know, El Jefe finally show up or find out a little bit more, something that they can give to Vice TV for that particular debut. So exciting that they're going to extend it out, make us guess, and keep us watching. So. From there, we started the night off with the Caribbean Championship matchup. So the Caribbean Championship matchup, Richard Holiday, the <clears> champion, <throat> defending against Gino Medina. We saw the announcement of this one at Never Say Never and match on. Again, this is one where I noted heel versus heel. We were talking a bit before the show, especially in this one, Gino Medina working really well as a heel, but it feels more like Richard Holiday, especially when he comes out, that arrogance about him, everything about him feels more heel than what Gino does. Gino has a natural baby face look in a sense. He he can come off arrogant and he plays heel well. I'm not knocking him at all, but just because of his, his youth and the way he looks, he feels like in this case, the look of him is more of the baby face while Richard Holiday looks more of the heel part. Again, that was my only real gripe with it. I mean, these guys worked well together. They know each other well enough. I like both guys and not a terrible match. They're not bad. Anyway, I think what, probably one of the better ones we're going to see on this particular night of MLW, in my opinion. What do you think, Bob Smoltz? Yeah, I, I thought this was an all right match. Um, like we were talking about Holiday before, I'm interested to see more of his work. I, I think he'll still have the breakout match or moment one of these days or one of these weeks on, on MLW. Um, yeah, you were talking about the fact that this card was heel versus heel, and it, it definitely was like that. But Medina healing it up more. Holiday was was wrestling uh, cleanly for a lot of this match, too, and uh, shows that he can do it, too, that he's got a, a, enough moves and enough skill to pull it off without, <clears throat> excuse me, without cheating. But uh, uh, I think... I liked the way Medina looked. I, I think this match was to build Medina more than Holiday, even though Holiday has that Caribbean championship around his waist. But uh, Medina was healing it up big time. He was uh, removing the turnbuckle padding. You knew that was going to come into effect at some point, one way or the other. Um, he Medina tried... Uh, used Holiday's own finisher against him. That's a pretty heelish thing to do to the uh, 2008 stock market crash or whatever it's called. It's kind of like one of those uh, face-busting kind of uh, moves. Use that on him. That, that, that really pissed off Holiday quite a lot. And then, uh, and then uh, yeah, Holiday 
ended up reversing a couple of moves and, and hitting his own. Yeah, pardon me, I'm, I'm speaking wrong about that finishing maneuver. That maneuver, that 2008 stock crash is uh, kind of a twisting suplex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what uh, got used earlier in the match, but then Holiday got the chance to recover and, and hit it towards the end of the match. Pinfall. Uh, this match was short, eh? six and a half minutes. So uh, they got it done. This was a nice short match. It was to the point. It got the trick done. They still grappled and wrestled cleanly for the first little bit too uh, in MLW kind of real fighting style. And this looked good. This was pretty all right. Not not my favorite match of the year, but uh, it, it did the trick. I came out of this one thinking um, if Richard Holiday did go on a full-faced baby face run uh, take away any of the heelish tacti- tactics that he's been doing lately with the you know having the ref on his side doing those kind of things you know the heel tactics that he plays up if he was on a legitimate baby face run and they built that up and then Medina had been built up as a heel for even longer and you put these two in the ring again that would have been so much stronger in, in essence because it would have felt more like it fit and again yeah Richard Holiday showing he can work as a baby face. And I think that there's a lot of potential for that down the line. Again, I, I get confused with him sometimes because he hangs out with Hammerstone. He's buddies with Hammerstone. They're paired up and everything. But then he does <clears throat> heal tactics usually until he goes and fights a guy like Medina. And then he's a baby face. It, it is a little bit confusing. I wish he wasn't so much of a tweener as they would call it. Pick a side. Let's see uh, what he could go with. I, I honestly think they could use another solid babyface character, despite him having that bit of arrogance. I think he could work it into a, a way that it could work for a babyface. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking about uh, the the faction known as Dynasty tonight too. It's never really been the same since there's just been the two guys, like since MJF left. And I feel like it's um, it's unnecessary for for Hammerstone it works still for Holiday I think but of course you can't have a one-man faction uh Hammerstone announces later in this episode that he's got uh, uh holding a press conference next week to announce some big news about the dynasty so I'm wondering what's going to happen with this faction I, do, I don't think it's much they, they don't even say the name of it all that much you do see Hammerstone and Holiday together sometimes but they never seem to really work as a faction. The, since they tried to get Gino Medina unsuccessfully, they've never really tried to replace MJF. Um, it just, I don't think this faction really is necessary anymore. So I'm not sure what the announcement will be next week, but uh, I have the feeling that uh, there are some changes coming up for the guys in the dynasty. Yeah, and we'll look forward to seeing that next week. Um but yeah, I mean, again, it's it wasn't a bad match. Again, there could be a lot to be said that could be done with these guys down the road. Looking forward to that much. Uh, from there, I believe we went to a video package showing about the chain rope match from last week, or not last week, but a couple episodes ago. And a uh, an injury that occurred, I guess. Uh, we, uh, we're one Von Eric short of a uh, tag team here now, Papa Smokes. Yeah, yeah, Marshall Von Erich announcing his knee injury at the hands of uh, Tom Lawler and Team Filthy. So um, he's going to be getting surgery and going to be out for a while. And we saw Kevin Von Erich, uh, their dad, talk to them a little bit. And uh, uh, Ross is going to go for some additional training. And uh, yeah, so I guess we won't be seeing the Von Erichs as a tag team for the next while possibly Ross as a single we don't know but I think uh, they they want to use the Von Erics as a tag team uh, we'll see what happens and we'll see how long Marshall's going to be out for but this could be interesting uh, could be an opportunity for Ross Von Eric to get in the singles ranks what do you think about this Bob yeah I mean it it's a shame because obviously we like the Von Erics uh, we wish Marshall a speedy recovery as well too Um, it could be a great opportunity for Ross if they decide to go that way. It could also be a very good opportunity to maybe get them more prepared and ready for a return to that ring as well, too. So if Marshall's taking that time off, Ross gets some more training, they're off TV for a little bit, and then when it's time to bring them back, you bring them back, they're even more prepared, more ring ready, looking even sharper, maybe even 
have gotten out there and, you know, worked even harder to get an even stronger, more solid look to their bodies. They come out looking like a million bucks. Immediately they're back in the, you know, thing with uh, Team Filthy and stuff like that. Eventually get their revenge, work their way back into that title picture that we've been talking about for so long. And there's your big, you know, hero story. The champions finally make their comeback after in- injury, after being kicked while they're down kind of thing. Finally make it back. It's the good old feel good Von Eric story. Ross and Marshall come back looking better than ever. Great tag champs. And from there you can figure out what to do with them down the road. Uh, but again, I don't know if singles is right for either one of them just yet personally. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that either. I just speculating as to what could happen in the future, but uh yeah, I have the feeling we won't be seeing the Von Eriks in the tag team picture on TV for the next bit. And that's fine. Like you say, that you, you go away for a while, let the fans miss you a little bit, let the fans want to get you back, learn a few new holds, um, get something new to your look and come back more stronger and more popular than ever. Yeah, damn straight, man. And uh, from there, we had the uh, Alexander Hammerstone promo. We are talking about uh, saying that he's got the big news of the Dynasty last week. We did kind of mention that. I uh, like some of the facts that were on the screen at the time, mentioning that Hammerstone has been the national openweight champion since June 1st of 2019, the first and only to carry this belt. Whether or not that will still be the case after tonight, we'll see as he's going against Gil Mortez for the championship. But, man, what a title reign for Alexander Hammerstone. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they they had brought that belt out and made it a new championship. Had a little tournament, Hammerstone won that. Uh, defended it for a little over half a year, but all these long reigns you hear about, a lot of them go through COVID, which was pretty much a full year kind of thing. So uh, as long as it sounds, he, he was inactive for a lot of that time too, but uh, not to take any, anything away from uh, your boy Hammer there. He, he's... Uh, definitely one of the top uh, personalities and faces in the company and uh, guys looking uh, looking for bigger and better things. And uh, yeah, the only real speculation is uh, about his uh, uh, national open weight championship is, is will he keep it into his world title run against uh, uh, Jacob Fatu or will he uh, uh, be stripped of this belt or lose this belt before that time? Yeah. We're not sure yet. He's got the battle with Contra going on. Uh, he's got a few things on his plate right now, and uh, time will tell. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he's looking great, though. And we'll see more of him later on in the show. Uh, after that, we had Alicia Toot doing an interview with TJP, talking about his actions against his uh, former friend, Buku Dao. Again, a lot of great work here from TJP, really selling this whole thing while they're keeping him and Buku Dao at distance and keeping this one-on-one encounter uh, off the table for the time being and making kind of prolonging it, making us wanting it a little bit more. Um, you know, TJP did what he needed to do here. Uh, I would like to see maybe more of an encounter at this point, though, at the same time, we've seen the TJP interview. We've seen the Buku Dao one. We've now seen the TJP one again to re- go over the actions. I think enough talk. Let's uh, let's see that action finally happen. Yeah, and I do believe they set that match for next week, did they not? So uh, we're going to finally see. I'm interested to, to see uh, what Buku Dao's got to offer. Uh, I know that uh, both of us were impressed with some of his work uh, in tag team matches with TJP in the previous weeks leading up to this, but uh, this is now uh, an actual program for him, uh, an actual feud, and and with his, uh, you know, buddy and mentor, uh, TJP, th- this could really be a hot match. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. And I do believe they did make it for the next week on MLW Fusion. So one to yeah. look forward to for sure. Uh, from there, uh, we were talking earlier about the tag team title picture. Well, I mean, we're talking about a tag team who once again, we, I've mentioned many times about why they keep appearing in the PWI's top five tag teams. Probably because there is only five tag teams in the division, six if you include the champs. But the Dirty Blondes are back with Aria Blake and taking on Los Parks with Selena for the MLW Tag Team Champions. Uh, did not see this one coming. It wasn't previously announced. I guess this one, there's something that happened prior to this episode going on the air, which led to this tag match taking place between these two teams. But interesting to see the Dirty Blondes finally back in the picture after all this talk. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, we've been curious about them. They've they really only used them. Uh, have we only seen one match of theirs before on Fusion, I think, or maybe two? Uh, one Fusion and one at night, uh, Kings of Coliseum, but that was that right. kind of barroom brawl with the Von Erics there. Right, right, yeah, There was right. a squash match, I believe, on Fusion leading up to that. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Glad to have another tag team here. Uh, don't know much about these guys still and uh, don't know much about Aria Blake either, but uh, they're clearly building the heat between uh, the uh, Ron Parker's uh, stud stable and, and the Dirty Blondes and uh, uh, Promociones Dorado with uh, Selena De La Renta. There seems to be some friction going on between these two groups. And uh, we saw some of that explode in this match and uh, after this match. Yeah, we sure did. I mean, even the ladies get into it after this one. Uh, Alicia, uh, sorry, not Alicia, but uh, Selena and Aria right in the center of that ring. And a little cat fight broke out there. And uh, the guys had to pull these two apart. I think they would have clawed each other to death otherwise. Yeah, yeah. But um, in all honesty, I didn't see a lot in this match. It seemed like it was a bit of a mess. I'm not sure if it was partly the way the match was laid out beforehand or in the execution of it somehow, but uh, the Dirty Blondes were healing it up. They jumped, uh, jump-started the match with the attack from behind, um, somehow being more heelish than Lost Parks, which is kind of difficult to do. But uh, Lost Parks, of course, uh, uh, changed, turned that around. But really, this match I found messy, um, there were some moments where it slowed right down where I, you could tell the wrestlers are kind of like, Oh shit, where are we? And what do we do now? And you know that that can be in a split second and they can fix that. We've seen matches where they do that, but that didn't happen in this match. This match had the viewer sitting there going, what are they doing? Like, why, why are they all just standing there? Or what's supposed to be happening right now? That's not really what you want in a professional wrestling match, to say the least. But, uh, you know, shit happens. Not every match is perfect. Uh, th this one was a bit of a schmozzle. But uh, uh, Lost Parks had uh, L.A. Park Jr. hiding under the ring again, of course, and uh, came out for the double groin shot, which gave the advantage to Lost Parks. And uh, you could see Selena was very nervous about this match uh, at ringside. Uh, and then hence the uh, attack on Aria Blake afterwards. Blake had been interfering in the match too. I mean, Dirty Blondes were more heelish than Lost Parks in this match. And uh, yeah, you knew something was going to boil over at the end of this. Selena attacks Aria. Girl fight I've got in my notes here with several okay. exclamation points. That was pretty exciting, I suppose. And uh, I don't know, is this to set up a bit more of a feud between Lost Parks and Dirty Blondes? Unknown because uh, Dirty Blondes only seem to ever appear uh, every few weeks. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a match. And uh, that's all I got really to say about that. Yeah. And I got to bring it up. I don't know if you caught this, but when L.A. Park Jr. comes from under the ring, gets in that ring, does the double groin shot, the referee was half turned towards the competitors at the time. Yeah. Knowingly, that unless this guy has no vision out the right side of his face, would have been able to see that there was a third member of Los Parks in the ring to begin with, let alone two guys getting nut shot right in front of them, both go down, and then right away as they hit the ground, the cover happens. L.A. Park Jr. is not even out of the ring yet. He's still in the ring physically, and the ref turns straight around for that three count. I'm sitting there, I'm chuckling a bit because they don't usually make mistakes like this too often with MLW, but this match had it. This match had those mistakes. It was a little bit goofy, not to my taste. I, I, I don't have a problem with any of the competitors. I mean, Dirty Blondes, I'd like to see more of before I make any real judgment. I don't mind how they work. I think with the right team, maybe it could be right. I'm not saying Los Parks isn't the right team. But again, this is heel versus heel. It was them out healing guys who we know are heels and win as heels. It really made no sense. Nothing there. Nothing much more I can add, Bob Smokes. I think, honestly, we're better off to go over it next to the next interview on the show. Yeah, it happens. And, and not every match is a five-star Meltzer extravaganza. <laughs> so uh, we'll just leave it at that. You bet. 
Uh, next up, we had a Leo Rush interview. So uh, Alicia Toot sitting down with Leo Rush, uh, talking about the potential for Rush versus Reed too. We know Reed lays down a promo making the challenge as well too. He wants this matchup to happen. We as fans want it to happen because this was a really strong middleweight championship match. And I think great on them for going and uh, waiting a little bit, giving Leo some other matches under his belt before they went right back into a sequel to this one here. And uh, great, you know, promo as always from Leo saying what he needs to say in there. I uh, love his little jokes about Alicia getting a watch so she can uh, know when it's rush time and stuff like that. I mean, it's arrogant. It's fun at the same time. I enjoy the way the kid talks. Nice work from Leo. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more with that. Uh, like we've discussed before, I, I was ready to shit all over this guy because I've heard some of the re- some of his reputation in the business. So he, it seems like he kind of lives his character. He really is. He really does believe that he's kind of the best thing around. But uh, since I watch his work in MLW, uh, it, yeah, he's kind of convinced me. He's really quite good at healing it up big time. He's an arrogant little jerk. He's got the He's got that face that you just want to punch so bad. He's got the rap career that he's bragging about and stuff like he's really hitting it uh, out of the park in this, in the, in MLW. And I'm loving it. I also think that was a good point that you made that they're waiting on this rematch a little bit, because that, that is probably the big money match. We've seen, uh, we've seen Leo rush versus uh, Laredo kid. That's pretty big match. That was a good one, but uh, uh Byron is the guy that could maybe beat Leo and maybe put his shoulders to the mat for the three count. That's the one we're all waiting for. I like it. They're going to make us wait a little bit and and put it on a bigger stage. Very smart again by Court Bauer. Yeah. And I can, again, maybe see that one happening for Vice TV's debut. I mean, they got to save some big stuff for that night. I'm sure we're going to be seeing some good title fights that night for sure from MLW. So looking forward to that. Uh, speaking of title fights, here it is, the main event of the night. Uh, finally, we've got a face versus heel match here on this MLW card, Pop Smokes. Uh, so the MLW National Openweight Champion, Alexander Hammerstone, he's defending against the big man, Neil Mortez, who had beaten him down, taken the championship, not by any legal terms of in-ring action, but by nine-tenths of the law and stealing the title away. Now we're going to find out who really is the champ. Does Hammerstone keep the title? Does Mil Mortez walk out the new official champion? Uh, And would more unfold with the whole El Jefe story? And I guess uh, the answer to that is not a bad match. I mean, I like these guys. They slugged it out really good. I think my biggest beef I'm going to say right now, this was really overshadowed by all this work they were doing with selena and azteca underground the announcers kept so much focus on that that i felt like it maybe took away from what otherwise could have been a lot stronger matchup um just in terms of selling it from a commentary standpoint i feel like it was undersold just how important this was how great these guys were the background that a guy like Neil mortez has and you know even like I guess like Alexander Hammerstone picking up a win, how big a deal that is against a guy, the caliber of Neil Mortez at the same time. I feel it was a little overshadowed, but fuck it anyway. I mean, the match was decent. And again, seeing Hammerstone lift Neil Mortez's big ass up at the end of that matchup, man, that was, that was just cool. I mean, that made my night right there of everything of the entire night. That was my favorite spot of the entire card was watching that from Alexander That's- Hammerstone one of the best spots they've had in general in a long time because that that really had some oomph to it uh, and when you watch the the whole match too i mean hammer started in on this uh, as, as as soon as mil muertes got to the ring hammerstone started with anger and fire right he's had his belt stolen from him and and he's been the, you know humiliated in public a little bit by mil muertes so a huge attack using power moves uh, some Big strikes, some big suplexes here from Hammerstone. Really, really looking nice. And then Muerte's starting to take over um, using heel tactics. Uh, again, working a body part. And I love this psychology too. What does Muerte's go after on Hammerstone? But the lower back. He's trying to take away the big man's strength. He wants to take away that nightmare pendulum finisher. He doesn't want to take that. Who would want to take that? It's such a devastating finisher. My God, like, 
I don't know how you could do that nicely. Like it's very, very impactful, especially with two 260 pound guys like that. I mean, that is a big, big impact to make. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Muertes had attempted his straight to hell finisher uh, Hammerstone getting the reversal on it. And then when I saw him setting that up, it was just like, good God, are you going to get this huge muscle head up here? And absolutely no problem. Looked like he was doing it to a 200 pound guy or a, uh, someone even that weighed less than that. It, it was just beautiful the way they did that move. Uh, and uh, I mean, once that hit, there was no question of the pinfall. Hammerstone retains. Muertes is hurt. Hammerstone gets his belt back. Selena's Selena's uh, losing her mind and stressed out completely. Uh, this was the finish we all wanted, and uh, it really, really looked good. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about that nightmare of Angelo being impactful. It was fantastic. I mean, again, it, the match itself was solid, but that one moment, and that's a moment in wrestling you love to see and stuff like that. They talk about all these moments that we remember and stuff like that. I'm going to remember that moment. I'm going to remember it next year and the year after that and the year after that. That is a moment. And it's because that takes an incredible amount of strength to do to anybody, but the, a guy the size of Mio Mortez, and they worked it so beautiful. Not only did Hammerstone have to use a lot of strength and leverage, but Mio Mortez had to be able to cooperate into that move without showing it being a cooperative move at the same time. But beautifully done, beautifully taken. Nobody looked like they legitimately got any injury from it but it still made it look like it fucking hurt and great on them i popped big time for that it could also be that i mean the rest of the card was a little underwhelming at that point when i got to this one i was excited it built it got to that spot it impacted i jumped out of my seat hell yeah hammerstone does it but then real no follow up to the what was going on with selena and el jefe i guess we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer I mean, I, they, they built towards it. They teased it a bit. We didn't get it. But, you know, at the same time, who cares? Hammerstone killed it. Great job. He's gotten over the hurdle with Mil Mortez. Again, I, they also teased earlier in the night that Mods Kruger might be in the in the back somewhere. And we didn't even yeah. get an attack from Mods Kruger on this one, too. So. Yeah, yeah. And just to talk about the Nightmare Pendulum again, too, the, the one of the last uh, big matches we saw Hammerstone have was against Mads Kruger, where he wasn't able to hit that Nightmare Pendulum. Kruger being six foot six or seven or whatever he is, he might be too tall, he might be too heavy for it. Hammerstone couldn't get him up for it, so it, it gave that he gave that appearance of uh, that he might not be able to do it on the bigger guys. So uh, there was that question in everybody's mind is, will he be able to get a big muscular man like uh, Mil Muertes up? And then, oh, we got that answer in a big hurry in this match. And damn, that, that was a fine, fine finish. Which now begs the question, is it possible that when he does finally go one-on-one -on -one with Kruger and get that in-ring matchup, does he finish him with that move? Can he actually pull it off? Is that going to be another big pop spot for us as fans? You don't think it can happen. Then suddenly Mods Kruger's big ass is going up and down for the nightmare pendulum. And imagine the impact that one's going to take when that guy's six foot six ass hits that ground. For sure. And, and it begs the question also, what about if he gets it on Jacob Fatu? Could Fatu kick out of that i mean it seems unlikely but he hasn't been the champ all this time for nothing many questions without answers left here and uh, we just gotta we gotta have some matches to answer those questions you bet and it's answers or questions without answers that keep us coming back week after week that's good television they keep wondering about how you make wrestling good how you engage the fans and keep them interested write something that makes sense makes me care about it makes me want to come back for more we don't need goofy storylines who's sleeping with who days of our lives jerry springer bullshit from the 1990s we need good solid people who want to get in there they want to work because they want championships they want money they want the fame they want the glory and they want to be known as a fucking wrestler and that's what mlw gives you week after week I have loved watching this show become such a, a mega fan of it in so many ways. You know, after watching WrestleMania just recently, and we're not going to talk about WrestleMania in depth here or anything like that, 
I go back yeah, and watch good. a show like MLW and I'm popping more overall than I was at a WrestleMania. And that seems kind of chaotic and weird because that wouldn't have been the case with me 10, 15 years ago, maybe even not five years ago. I wouldn't have even thought twice about it, but that's the way it's become. I mean, you get your hits and misses on the big guy shows once in a while you get a good match, but MLW for the little nitpicks we have at it. And sometimes, you know, again, this episode, maybe not as strong as previous ones. I still don't want to turn away from it. I want to find out what happens next. It's okay that they have slip ups every once in a while, because I know I'm, they're going to make up for it. And they're giving me hours and hours of great free wrestling entertainment week after week. So big thank you to MLW for that. Yeah. And I, I like the smaller company too. That's, that's younger, smaller, hungry. They want to get up and, and they want to get more um, eyes on their product. They want more success. And it just feels like some of the big, a couple of the big feds have that and aren't really trying that much anymore. That the motivation isn't there to keep putting on big matches that pop, to, to keep doing, like working hard at, at laying out matches and uh, booking matches with psychology that's logical and makes sense. I think that art is becoming lost uh, in these, these modern times where, as uh, all the old classic bookers aren't working in the business anymore or are passed away by this time or uh, uh, just aren't active in wrestling anymore. And uh, you know, we've got, uh, we got TV comedy writers and, 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 and people that haven't grown up in the wrestling business writing some of this stuff, which is why it doesn't make sense, I think. And uh, Nick, thankfully not so with uh, MLW. Uh, Court's got a great staff and, and, and uh, booking people, uh, laying out the matches and all that stuff. And hasn't it been a breath of fresh air to watch some new product that, that doesn't have that, that stink of uh, modern wrestling on it? Oh, does it ever, Bob Smokes. I'm glad to tune in every week, and I'm glad, as always, to be able to come on here, do these reviews, and engage with not only our fans, but fans of MLW, as well as the uh, MLW roster. Uh, more and more, they're becoming more engaged with the video bros as well, too, so it's great to see. Thank you to yeah. everybody at MLW who continues to uh, like what we do and uh, give us shout-outs every once in a while, too. It really helps us out as well, too, and, you know, makes – me and I'm sure yourself feel more validated in what we're doing when people who we're talking about listen in and appreciate it at the same time. So props to them for uh, liking what we do and helping us out by giving us shout outs as well too. So, and you know, as always can't thank the listeners enough, everybody who tunes into the show, whether it be right here on the video boroughs network, backbreaker media, Canadian wrestling network, or any of the other places that you can find ring respect these days, a big shout out to any of you who take any time out of your day to listen to what pop smokes and I do right here on ring respect radio. Uh, thank you once again for tuning into this episode of the show. Uh, we want you to go ahead, click that subscribe button down below, share us all over social media, share the love, and uh, engage us in the comment section down below. Paul Smokes and I want to hear from you. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.